Hello all, Game Methuselah here. Kind of starting to work a little bit more on getting the Red Dragon ready and get some paint on it. So first thing I wanted to do was add a little detail. You might notice I pulled the camera back as requested. I don't know if this is going to work well, so I tried to put a sweet spot here. First thing I'm going to do here before I get right onto the paint is I'm going to set down a little bit of stone area to give me a place where the base is a little... I think exposed uh, without any real interesting deal to it. And this is not an uncommon thing I do. Is I'm going to put a little pile of rock, which then I'll later paint uh, like stone uh, or kind of rough dirt. And I use two kinds. Normally I just use kitty litter. Um, like cats love to provide that. So that's kind of what I use. But I had this. This was old Steve Kish's, some, some shale rock he has. And then some other little ground stone that I have. So I'll mix the two to make uh, kind of a combination on this, just old white glue, Elmer's white glue that you might have used when you were a kid. Uh, not the paste you ate, but actually the things you used to sort of glue junk together. It's not very good glue for anything, but it works well for this, for putting down stone. Okay, here we go. I wanted to do a little test subjecting on the paint. I went through about a dozen paints I have. I really was going to go out and buy some brand new Vallejo dark red paint to use. Um, but they didn't have it over at the hobby shop I went to yesterday, which was unfortunate. And that meant I would have had to drive over to Brookhurst and really kind of wasn't in the mood. So I went home and started to go through my paints. And here I am looking at a nice, well-made, beautiful dragon. And I'm going to use Steve Kish's cheap paint. But this is going to work. As I look through the colors, I laid this down because I wanted to see the density of color and its appearance. And this looks perfect. I love this color. This is going to be the base dark red that you're going to see. Everything on the dragon, theoretically, that isn't going to be brown undershade is going to be this kind of dark red. It'll, of course, look lighter when it's done because all the highlighting and everything always does that. But you'll see that as it goes. The other thing I did is I put it across the two problematic seams that I had on the on the figure to try to see, you know, where I might have some work to do in my my painting to dry brush. And as I was studying the dragon and looking at it, something suddenly came up, and I'd like your help on this. So I don't know if anybody knows if Matt has any canon produced or any information upon these this ruby dragon or any of the dragons yet, but I had a question. Along all these horns and tusks, which are all here, you see, my original plan with the claws and the horns and the tusks was all to do them like in sort of like bone claw type material, which is normally what I would do for dragons. But then suddenly I kept thinking, well, this dragon has atrophied wings and doesn't fly anymore. And these tusks sort of look like kind of shards that you would see of crystals. So I'm thinking, well, wait a second, instead of having the gems be these sort of large scales, which was sort of my original plan, we'll just make them sort of hard calcified scale, and then we'll do all the horns and, and claws and all as if they were sort of ruby crystals coming out of the dragon. Now, I don't know how it's going to look, but it's it, Envision is, is really kind of cool to me, the idea that... This old dragon's bones long since have turned to this real dense magical ruby crystal material. And thusly, he's so much heavier, he can't fly. And thusly, why over the years they've atrophied. But it gives him sort of magical advantages and things like that. Now, again, I'm just sort of making this up out of whole cloth as I sit here looking at the figure. But I kind of think it might be cool to try that. Now... I'm conscious of the fact that this might be the first of the ruby dragons to get painted, so I kind of don't want to do something that's really weird out there that, that no one's going to like, but I think this might be an interesting concept, and I'd like to have your feedback. And maybe if you've read any of Matt's playtest, or if you're in on anything that maybe I haven't heard about, you know, let me have some thought if whether they're thinking those are crystals coming out of his head, or they are indeed just sort of bone, or whether there was any conversation or not, because that's where I'm leaning. So anyway, I'm going to show you now how I lay down the base paint. What we do here, and if I get out of out of uh, a vision a little bit, you're going to have to understand that I'm not looking in through this, this camera here, because people want to get a little farther back. I'm taking the paint, I'm just adding water to it. I find that whenever you're laying down your base coat, always better to be thin than thick. You can always put on more paint later, but it's much harder if you put down too much 
to get the excess off. In this case, because he's a dragon, I'm using a big flat brush, very soft, that allows me to put the paint on. And as you see, it's not just a dragon in this situation. It's almost like any miniature I paint. I tend to just slop the paint on. I'm not concerned uh, about anything other than just getting a coverage. And often, as you can maybe see in the shoulders, and I don't know whether you can, maybe I can show it up. When you put it on thin, it starts to give you lots of the detail for your dry brushes later. So you can sort of see where you're going to end up painting the, the different colors. The only problem I'm having here right now is as I put this red on with the, the light gray uh, undercoat primer, it's beginning to look a little more pink than I would have maybe liked. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. If I if I don't like it as well, then I obviously can, can darken it up with some other colors. It's even conceivable I could go get a different paint. But again, that's the advantage of keeping your paint really wet when you're putting your initial coat down because you're not going to clog up any of the detail by putting too much paint on it. What you're going to end up hopefully doing in many ways is pulling out the detail so that you can see it later. Because all the important things in doing the finishing product are going to come with the dry brushes and highlights and, and then the washes and the shading that you do to make your figure come alive. And that's what you want. My buddy Steve Kish was really a master at monsters. I mean, not only did he do wonderful shading and dry brushing, but he was great at picking alternate colors. And we'll try to work on that as well. Like if you've ever seen, well, I guess maybe Matt talked about it and I showed you briefly that old black dragon. That black dragon that Steve painted had purple and yellow and orange and all kinds of colors you would have never imagined in a million years that you'd see in black. But when you mix them subtly together, you suddenly get a real set of life that you don't always see um, in just standard paint jobs. Often what I call the Games Workshop style is, is paint them bright and paint them bold so you can see them from across the board. That's good, but I kind of like Steve's attitude of painting the miniatures so they look like they got up and walk, ready to walk off your table if you're not careful. Again... Just slopping the paint on. I'm, I'm hoping I don't lose you as I turn it here. I'll try to look back. No, it still seems like we're sort of in frame. Now, you might not be able to see as good a detail. Again, the paint came on much thicker than I wanted, so I'm just going to keep thinning it down with water because what I want to make sure I do is don't add too much paint. But we're just going to keep putting it on. Now, it's a little harder for me because normally I just pick this up and zoom it around while I'm, while I'm painting, but... I don't think you're going to see anything if I do that. Now you won't. So I'm going to try to keep it down a little slower process than I would normally like um, because I've got a lot of years of painting a certain style. But for me, what I want is I just want to get the base coat down as covered as possible. Because remember, in this case, we're looking to get ready to speed paint. So I'm going to come up with tactics. Now, if we do decide to do these as crystals, which I really am leaning to right now, um, I'm going to have to figure out a nice way to do sort of a crystal uh, speed paint to get something to kind of look like crystals, but not take five hours, ten hours to produce. Um, there's lots of really good techniques for crystalline out there. I've seen people paint it. Sometimes it looks just remarkable. And for you people, when you get your dragons and if you've got the skill and you've got the time, um, hell, if you just have the time, you can actually learn the skill. There are some great sites on YouTube that show you how to paint these. So just put in how to paint crystals, you know, any of this stuff. And I will bet you, now I haven't looked yet, but I will, um, that there's going to be a bunch of sites up there for people who are showing you how to do this so you can get prepped up. That's what they like to do. I mean, it's really good to put these sites up. But there are some other really good sites out there for people like how to paint your first miniature or how to do simplified things, which is a lot what I'm trying to show you here. Anybody who can spend the hours can eventually produce a really fabulous figure. I mean, to have artistic talent sure makes it a lot easier, but eventually you'll learn the techniques and ability and muscle memory and all that to do this. And, you know, you may never get a golden demon. I guarantee you, I have seen guys who started out with mediocre skills in their Warhammer fantasy armies that I used to play with back in the 90s. And, you know, I teach them a few things and then they'd go home and they would come back and in six months they were better painters than me. 
That's just a matter of your eye and technique and what you like and what you think looks good. And not everybody agrees. You know, that's why when I judged the painting contest in Vegas, uh, I guess a year and a half ago, I, I told everybody on my Twitter feed, I said, judging a painting contest says substantially more about the judge than the quality of the painting. I thought everybody who was in that competition could have won almost any other painting competition at a regular convention. But there was just so many beautiful pieces. Uh, most of them, of course, were for GW products and stuff, but that's no you know, argument. But there's also a great deal of styles. This miniature would really scream to be airbrushed. I'm guessing any of the larger dragons really, really would look great in these airbrush techniques. I'd even look at that if if I were you, especially if I knew an airbrush, which I do, but I don't do that. Most of my airbrushing, I always do for my armored models, for my historical games and stuff, and I don't usually plan to do the shading techniques with the airbrush. I always go back and usually do them with the brush. Now, that more likely has a lot more to do with my age and my skill set and the fact that how I learned to paint. Uh, and when I was painting figures, you know, back for competition in the International Plastic Modeler Society, or even in the 70s when I would take all my miniatures to game conventions to play, and there was always a painting contest which I would stick them in. And I don't think for maybe the first three to five years, I didn't go to a convention where I did not win something in the painting contest. And that really has to say that at the time, the skill levels were nothing like they are now. I mean, I've seen some beautiful paintings, some, some beautiful miniatures that Matt has gotten commissioned by pro painters. And he said, you know, I told him, I said, well, you should just send this guy, you know, one of your dragons and have him do the airbrush paint job on it. And Matt says some of these guys who are obviously advising him now are saying, oh, no, man, there are guys out there who are really good. These guys are not good enough. Uh, that might be true. My only problem with it, of course, is that I think good is based a on the beholder of the paintbrush and what you want to do and how much time you're willing to spend. I think it's kind of a, a misstep sometimes to you to show a painting of a of a guy who spent his entire life being a grand artist and then having him paint your figure and say, mm, yeah, mine really looks like junk compared to that. And believe me, I've had that feeling where I'll look at something I've painted where I thought I did a fabulous job and then I look at the pro painter who painted it and went, well, okay. I guess it wasn't that fabulous. All right, guys. Well, there she is. That's the first base coat on there. Now, I'm I'm thinking this looks a little lighter than I had necessarily hoped, but that'll all be fixed as we do the others. Again, never, ever, ever panic when you're painting. You're using acrylic paints, which are water-based. So you can always just thin things down if you start to do stuff and you don't like it and and work. And with a little help from you guys, uh, we'll get some ideas of what, what we want it to look like. And it'll be out there soon. So there you go. Fight me, devils, fight, for I hate peace. And we'll see you soon.